Hi, this is Dr. Steven Seiler. A few days ago, I was asked to give a couple of lectures for the U.S. Rowing Coaches Conference. Now, this was a digital affair, so I gave the lecture from the comfort of my home office, just like I am doing now. Uh, there were 350 participants, lots of questions. I was able to answer some of them, but not all. So, uh, here are a few of the questions that came through. Uh, that I wasn't able to answer. Okay, now uh, again, this was from the U.S. Rowing Conference, and the first question that I received was this one. Would you change a training plan for someone who tends to have a higher heart rate from trauma? They go into the fight-or-flight response during high-intensity pieces. Now, pieces are intervals or interval bouts in rowing lingo. Now, the, the question, the person asking the question goes on to say, I know there are many Olympians with traumatic experiences uh, in the past, and so it's clearly possible to reach a high level, uh, in other words, despite this trauma, but I'm interested in knowing how the body handles training differently with the higher cortisol and so forth. So this is a great question, and up until a year or two ago, I probably would have said that, you know, the physiology uh outweighs this meaning that the high intensity intervals once you get started with the intervals the physiology takes over the psychology gets washed to the side but i don't think that's true anymore and i do know i've seen it in my own daughter who i coach that uh athletes can get really stressed by interval sessions because of the expectations it's not just how hard it's going to be but it but the anticipation of what's coming and especially when they try to race the intervals because they the coach is watching they ex they need to do well they think they need to do well in order to maintain their position on the team or whatever it might be so physiological stress is high enough and then you add in a lot of psychological stress so how would i handle this well uh, the first thing I've got to think about as a coach is, look, training is training and racing is racing. And I want my athlete to train, not race, those interval sessions. Uh, occasionally, yeah, maybe they're going to go higher, you know, like a race. But most of the time, I want to back them down to 90%, tell them to do the work, and, you know, with good quality, but in a way that if they had to, they could do one more of those intervals before, you know, when they're finished. They get up and off the bike or the rowing machine or the off the track with a little bit left in the tank. And, and then we reduce that trauma. We do the work. We get a great training response. And then we've still got a higher gear to go to on race day. And trust me, it'll be there. Uh, but you can't go there every time you do an interval session or it is traumatic and it does create a lot of anxiety just in the anticipation of having to do these sessions okay all right now i want to go to the next question which is this one let's see if we can get it up there i work with juniors at all skill levels and ages from junior high to high school we use 2000 meter tests 2k tests to determine training zones right now now, in rowing, 2,000 meters is standard distance. A 2K test on the standard Concept 2 rowing ergometer is going to take anywhere from 6 minutes to 8 minutes, depending on the gender and the level and heavyweight versus lightweight and so forth. But it, any way you cut it, high intensity, very close to VO2 max, over VO2 max, big anaerobic component in a test like that. And to be honest with you, I just wouldn't use that as a test for determining training zones. Now, obviously, you're going to want to test 2000 sometimes because it is the test of performance, but not of training intensity. OK, now, if I want to try to make some estimations on training intensity without having blood lactate profiling and all this kind of lab stuff, then I would probably have my kids do, uh, you know, in the late fall, early, early January, I'm going to have them do, have them do a 30 minute or a 40 minute steady state test where I'm going to have them basically do a yeah, something close to a 10,000 meter depend you could either use distance or time for juniors probably 40 minutes is a good distance uh, or a good duration for elites they may go 60 but 40 minutes is going to give me something like a maximum lactate steady state it'll be around that second lactate threshold that they're holding if they go hard okay and then once you know that you can take perhaps uh 60% of it to 75% uh, 
7075 and use that as the more low intensity training and then when they get up under it that's going to be threshold and then when they're above that that 40 minute test power then we're talking interval training okay so that's a way to to use power to make the training zones reasonably well and if they're doing the low intensity long steady states they should be able to speak sentences uh, if not then they're probably hyperventilating which means they're probably into that threshold region okay so don't use a 2k test do the 2k test for its own purpose but don't use it to uh, determine training zones okay all right now let's look at another question I have wondered why masters rowers are racing 1k and physiologically how at odds that is with what rowers particularly masters rowers like to do long slow steady state I think it's still the best way to improve technically but how do I reconcile the effect of training I recently started coaching a master's team. Should I have them do more land training with strength and conditioning as a way to balance the training program? All right. Again, great question. And, and this speaks to the heart of one of the issues of just aging and endurance performance. And you are right. As we age, we are relatively better or we maintain, relatively speaking, our long endurance capacity. We lose our upper end, our top gear. Why? Well, there's two reasons. One, we lose it because maximum heart rate goes down, which means maximum cardiac, cardiac output goes down and oxygen delivery goes down. So that upper end goes, gets you know, uh, pushed downward a little bit, slowly with age. The other issue, though, is we lose muscle mass, which is w the heart of your question here. And yes, the answer to your question is definitely get your master's athletes, your age groupers in the weight room. Uh, I'm 55. I need strength training because that's what's going to tend to go is you're going to lose that the big muscle power. You're going to lose your glutes. You're going to lose your quad strength. You're going to lose that that drive that you need from the hips. So I'm going to have my athletes. I'm going to do myself leg press, lunges, squats, even maybe some power cleans and so forth to try to maintain that. Uh, and then that's going to help me in these shorter races in the boat. Okay, so that's true for all of us, whether we're cyclists, runners, rowers, and so forth, is as we get older, we lose the maximum heart rate, but we also lose muscle mass if we keep the status quo. So we have to work a little extra to keep the strength up and keep the muscle mass up. Okay, all right, let's go to another question. Fourth question, I believe. Another good one. What do you tell your athletes to do or not do on their rest days? How much or how would you describe a rest day? How much activity is too much? Oh, man. Great question. And, and this one uh, gets me because a lot of people get this idea of so-called recovery runs or recovery rows, recovery rides. And, and my question then is, well, is, are you recovering better out training than you would be recovering sitting at home or making cookies or playing with the kids or something i'm not sure the data doesn't support it but i i get it my rule would be if you have a rest day then anything you do that day physically in the form of exercise should not feel like training clear and simple we want to reduce the load on the body and we also want to reduce the load on the brain on the mind okay now i used to work with cross uh, the, uh, speed skaters in the netherlands and they would take sundays off during the preparation period and sometimes we'd go hiking sometimes we did go-kart racing just different things but but there wasn't training. It was just physical activity, use, you know, getting out, stretching their legs, but laughing, having a good time, and just totally unloading from that grind, the systematic work of preparing for competitions. And that's what we need to think of with as rest days. Rest is rest. Okay? Now, you may see that during the Tour de France, elite cyclists who are racing for six hours. When they finally get a rest day, they still will go out and spin for 90 minutes. And, and, and it seems like that's important just to keep their hormone balance because it's too big of a drop if they go from six hours of extremely hard training to nothing and then six hours again the next day. So they'll, 
they'll try to keep the wheels spinning. But for them, it's still, it doesn't feel like training. It's just, it's easy, easy. All right? So that's my deal on rest days. Rest is rest. Training is training. Don't, don't get confused and do all this recovery training that ends up just being another training session. All right. Now, let's go to another and the final question, which is maybe the biggest one. And that's this one. I was thinking about the slides Dr. Seiler put up and his focus on polarizing b below the first and above the second threshold. I'm aware that a lot of cyclists focus on spending a lot of time in the sweet spot, which, as I understand it, is just below the second threshold. Now, he goes on to say, or she goes on to say, I've heard it said that spending a lot of time just below threshold is a great way to improve aerobic capacity. Is that simply just a different theoretical framework or... Uh, more succinctly, how does sweet spot training fit into the 80-20 concept, if at all? And then finishes with, like many masters, I only have so much time, so I want to make sure that every workout is productive. All right, this is <laughs> a classic question, important question. First of all, uh, one of the things that I struggle with with sweet spot training is that it's not always defined very clearly. You here have defined it as just below the second threshold, meaning threshold training. It's in that range between first and second lactate turn points. Okay, that would be threshold training. And I know what that feels like. I know what that means and I know what it does. But if I talk to different people and read different things, I see sweet spot described as everything from just below the first lactate turn point to just above the second lactate turn point. So meaning, well, you can all all the training zones that I am use would could potentially be classified as sweet spot, uh, depending on who you talk to. So that's confusing. But if we assume threshold training now, if you're untrained and you do a lot of threshold training, you will get fitter. Works great. Eight weeks threshold training, three or four days a week, out there, 45 to 60 minutes in that threshold range, you will improve your VO2 max, you will improve your threshold power or pace, definitely. Problem is, is that if you just keep doing that for the 12th week and the 16th week and, the, and after six months, you're stagnated. You're not getting better, okay? And that's why, and athletes have understood this, that we have to both extend and intensify. We have to have longer, slower sessions. We have to have high intensity sessions. And so we have to find the balance between those. All right. And that's, that balance is, is conceptually what this polarized training is about. Now, in that, do they fit together? Well, yeah, a hard sweet spot session uh, like a, you know, a two hour threshold session, which would be a, a, a long Zwift race. Uh, I do those myself. Oh man, those are tough. And by the, you know, by the second hour at threshold, you are definitely working. It is a, it is a high stress session. So threshold training, I classify as high intensity. Uh, but you have to remember that you, you, as you get fitter, you can extend those thre threshold sessions. A marathon is a threshold, essentially, uh, you know, the, the first lactate threshold, extremely tough. So threshold is tough training if you go long enough, all right? But a lot, of a lot of people end up going both not too hard and not too long. And so it ends up in that, uh, what should we call it, that stagnation zone, one hour at threshold, okay? That's what we have to avoid, all right? Now, yeah, not enough time. I get it. Join the club. Lots of people have this issue. So let's say you only have four sessions uh, available for workouts per week or, or days per week, rowing or cycling or so forth. I'm going to want one of those to be pretty high intensity. I'm probably going to have a couple that are kind of uh, just solid endurance sessions where I may also make time for a couple of strength sessions, either at home or in the gym, just connected to that workout. So it's time effective. And then I'm going to want a, a long steady state. I'm going to try to get out on a Sunday or a, or a Saturday on the boat and row at least 90 minutes. Okay, 90 to even 120 minutes. Really working on that, uh, that durability and st uh, low intensity endurance. So those, that's the way I would use, say, four sessions a week in a kind of a polarized fashion. All right. So that is my basic answer to these questions. Uh, and I hope that it was useful for you. Thanks a lot.